Hollywood History is brought to you by Musicbed. Stick around to the end to find out how you can get one month free. It's October 1974, and Jaws has finally wrapped after a depressing five-month shoot, 100 days longer than scheduled. Cast, crew, and equipment are crumbling, tensions are high, and the production is five million over budget. Everyone on set knows it. This film is sinking right down to the ocean floor. And who was the director responsible for helming this shipwreck? A young, inexperienced Steven Spielberg. He worked his whole life for this moment, and this, his big break, was slipping right through his fingers. Steven dreamed of a fruitful directing career, so how was he going to turn this nightmare around? My name is Steve Spielberg, and I just directed a movie called uh, Jaws. We thought we were going to be there for the rest of our lives. Because we've been here 105 shooting days. And the anticipation was unbelievable. Unbelievable. God created the devil and gave him Jaws. The winner is... 1950s Cincinnati, Ohio. A young Steven Spielberg struggles academically and altercations with anti-Semitic bullies are worsening. On bad days, Steven wanders, doubting his uncertain future. The city envelops him, engulfs him, and he looks everywhere for an escape. He stumbles towards a glamorous looking building with shimmering lights and seductive atmosphere. Stephen had discovered the movie theater. Lawrence of Arabia. Godzilla! Tokyo! This place quickly became his safe space, a solace away from bullies and education. Movies had taken him in, and he was engrossed. Any genre, any audience, it didn't matter. Steven had found his passion, and he knew this was for him. And it didn't take long for him to join in. When he was a kid, he would take my movie camera and uh, use it. At 13, Stephen made Escape to Nowhere, an 8mm short war film fit with mud, blood, and guns. It was just making it up. We didn't have any special effects. The experience was electric, and by 17, Stephen directed a 140-minute sci-fi entitled Firelight. With what felt like a lifetime of experience under his belt, Stephen applied to a summer internship at Universal, eager to transform his bootstrapped filmmaking approach into something credible. But to the studio, Steve was just another enthusiastic teen with a camera. They rejected his internship, but kept their eye on him. At home, Stephen's parents were clashing and by 66 were divorced. Stephen moved to LA to live with his father, head down and focused on his studies. It wasn't until his early 20s, with the arrival of a new opportunity, that filmmaking became his main focus once more. Universal had returned and was now offering Stephen the chance to direct a short film, financed by Universal. Stephen seized the opportunity and crafted Amblin, a 26-minute love story about two hitchhikers crossing paths. The film won several festival awards and impressed Universal's vice president, Sidney Scheinberg. Spielberg had proved his potential with Amblin, and at 22 years old, it led him to becoming the youngest director ever to be signed to a long-term deal with a major Hollywood studio. This was the first movie that sort of got me into the movies because this movie got me a chance to have a contract to direct television. And this is the night gallery. Wasting no time, Stephen dropped out of college to take advantage of the opportunity. His first professional gig came as co-director on the 1969 pilot of Night Gallery. But eager to impress his significantly older crew, Stephen attempted flashy techniques, much to the dismay of his impatient colleagues. His fresh-faced inexperience was a surprise to all, totally alarming the show's star, Joan Crawford. And she looked at me and she almost screamed. She said, my God, we can't go out for dinner. People will think you're my son. But not one to falter under critical glances, Spielberg got to work and won Crawford over with his new approach to the NBC show. I'm not really proud of the show, but it was a great experience to be baptized that way. With this credit under his belt, Night Gallery opened the door for Spielberg to direct an array of TV episodes. Still new to the game, these roles were a chance for Spielberg to experiment and discover his style. While mostly creatively unfulfilling, these episodes paid the bills and impressed the folks back at Universal. The next few years marked Spielberg's introduction into feature-length filmmaking. Under a new contract with Universal, he released Duel, Something Evil, and Savage in a three-year window. With generally positive reception, Stephen was earning credibility as a filmmaker. But it wasn't until his 1974 crime drama, The Sugar Land Express, that the young director's reputation really formed. I have 
have not. You're lying. I am not lying. Don't lie to me. Don't you call me no liar. Universal was delighted with the Sugarland Express. He wasn't sharpening his talent on it, says publicist Oren Borston. He was a full-blown talent. The Hollywood Reporter wasn't kidding around either, saying a major new director and film were on the horizon. It was quite a statement, but Universal clearly agreed and decided it was time to really test our young Steven Spielberg. Luckily, Universal had recently bought the rights to a novel about a great white shark preying on a seaside town. This book was called Jaws, and it was flying off the shelves. This could be Steven's shot at going mainstream, really earn his stripes. It'd be a challenge, but was this his breakthrough moment? Peter Benchley's Jaws was all the rave in 1974 with an avid, pre-existing fan base. Universal were keen on releasing their adaptation as soon as possible. Steven Spielberg had beaten credible directors such as Dick Richards and John Sturges for the driver's seat, and it was a large undertaking for an unproven 26-year-old. This was a new challenge for Steven, and issues were already revealing themselves. Problems began as early as the scripting stage. Dozens of drafts were written by multiple writers. The script's main complaints were an abundance of unneeded subplots and a bleak tone. Carl Gottlieb was brought in to sprinkle some humor into the script, a move much approved by Spielberg. But this back and forth was taking up too much time, and the scripting stage ended up overlapping into production. This means some scenes were written and shot on the same day, something that proved challenging when you're out at sea. Steven was reluctant to shoot Jaws the simple way and insisted on capturing the story's splashy moments actually on the ocean. This approach was rarely taken and for good reason. Time and the tide still refuse to obey the director. We all gain a tremendous respect for the sea, for nature, for waves. Over half an hour is wasted for dry clothes and new makeup. By then, the light is wrong and the shot is put off till the following day. Heavy rain and winds destroyed camera equipment, sunk boats, and soaked the crew's spirits. But the biggest hurdle was the one everyone feared from the beginning. The shark. I knew they couldn't make a movie about it because the technology was nowhere near good enough to make a great white shark and I knew you couldn't catch and train one. Had we read it twice, in my opinion, we never would have made Jaws. It was an undertaking, that was for sure. This was uncharted territory and a feat most would call impossible at the time. Jaws was a story dependent on the fear instilled by a great white shark, something a lot harder to achieve if you have no shark. But nevertheless, the art and special effects team started scrambling together ideas to bring the terror to life. The crew landed on an animatronic build made up of hydraulic pistons that would allow a team of puppeteers to maneuver. The issue... They made a big mistake and they built it for fresh water. And this caused one considerable headache. Electrolysis is a major problem when you get salt into all the machinery, into, into oh. the, the electrical system. It was a serious lapse of judgment and one that would prove to plague the Jaws production schedule. The shark is not working. <laughs> we'll <pee. laughs> The shark is not working. Bruce the shark was no whip. This thing was packed with high-tech instruments and mechanisms that allowed for total control of every body part. If they could get it working, it would be a wonder. Three sharks were built at a cost of $150,000 each. One of them sank to the bottom of the ocean, and every day the sharks malfunctioned. The only things they were biting into was the production schedule and the budget. Over 20 technicians were required to handle the sharks, and even when they were working, they just didn't look great. The 58-day schedule quickly ballooned. It's really hurt our schedule because we've been here 105 shooting days. Cast and crew were pessimistic. One thing was certain, this was no Jaws, this was Flaws, as the crew nicknamed it. Spielberg had a golden opportunity with this movie and here he was, killing his career before it ever even got firing. Eventually, after 159 days on the water, Jaws wrapped on October 6, 1974. But the challenges didn't stop there. In Peter Benchley's novel, the opening scene sees a woman's deathly encounter with a great white shark. It vividly describes the attack and violence, but never the shark. As a reader, you're forced to conjure an image of this beast yourself. It's an effective tactic that builds both terror and suspense. Spielberg recognized this and knew it might be his film's savior. There was one last option. Option. Hide the shark. In the final cut of Jaws, the shark is present for no more than four minutes of screen time. Yet, its ever imminent presence shrouds the entire film. When we're near water, we feel vulnerable. The tension was fabricated from the shark's absence and everyone else's reaction. But there's more to it. With a specially constructed camera, Spielberg shot as much as he could at water level. This puts us in the perspective of a potential victim treading water. But potentially, the film's saving grace came in the form of John Williams. 
Those iconic notes are forever emblematic of impending doom. John Williams' score expertly conditioned us to associate the sound motif with the arrival of the shark. I think the score was clearly responsible for half the success of that movie. It's simple, but incredibly effective. It was time. On June 20th, 1975, Jaws was ready to be shown to the world. With a final budget of nine million, five million more than planned, Spielberg hadn't exactly gained the trust from Universal's presidents. But like the shark in the water, moviegoers were eagerly anticipating taking a chunk out of Jaws. And the anticipation was unbelievable. Unbelievable. With a masterful marketing campaign, when Jaws finally hit theaters, fans were lined up down the street. It was intense. People flocked to watch what came to be cinema's first ever blockbuster. Smoking Lodge is sold out, seats downstairs in the first seven rows open. It dominated the summer. Despite a very shaky production, Spielberg clearly had firepower when it came to the box office. It took less than a month for Jaws to gross 70 million and by the end of the year had reached 260 million. It eventually grossed 476 million worldwide, making it the highest grossing movie of all time. Until Steven's buddy George knocked him off the perch two years later. But Steven made a statement here and the people loved it. Next was to find out if the critics did. Live. The 48th Annual Academy Awards Presentation. My name is uh, uh, Steve Spielberg, and I just directed a movie called uh, Jaws. And Jaws is about to uh, be nominated in 11 categories. You're about to see us sweep the nominations. On March 29th, 1976, Stephen attended the Academy Awards at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles. Jaws had four nominations, including Best Picture. He was very confident in his movie, albeit disappointed he wasn't up for Best Director. I didn't get it! I wasn't nominated! It was a long, arduous journey to get here, but at the same time, Stephen couldn't believe he was here so quickly. Jaws' first nomination of the night was for Best Sound. Robert L. Hoyt, Roger Heeman, Earl Matare, and John Carter for Jaws! Thank you, everybody, very much. It was a good start to the evening, and next was Best Original Score. And the winner is... John Williams the Jaws. I'm a grateful man. Thank you very much. Two nominations, two wins, and the next up was Best Editing. Bernard Fields for Jaws. I say thank you. It was evident Jaws mania wasn't limited to the box office. Jaws had taken three Oscars out of a possible three, but Steven still had his eye on that final Best Picture award. However, Jaws was up against Barry Lyndon, Nashville, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and Dog Day Afternoon. Many have said this was the most challenging lineup for Best Picture ever. For Steven to win this, it'd be a huge accomplishment. It was disappointing to miss that last hurdle, but to win three Oscars was a fantastic achievement considering where they'd been. The journey could not have been more of a learning experience. Steven sharpened his skills in improvisation, problem solving, and learned not to wear his sleeve so publicly when it came to the Oscars. The experience made Steven Spielberg undeniable. Jaws had opened the doors to the career he dreamed of. He was no longer that small boy in Cincinnati, but the feeling he got in the movie theater as a child, that remained. And now he finally had the reins to tell his stories. Spielberg's journey to becoming one of the most iconic and masterful filmmakers of all time really is an inspiring one, and it was his drive and passion that pushed him beyond the technical limitations that existed in his youth. And nowadays we have an entire film studio in our pockets, and we're just an upload away from hundreds, thousands, or if you're incredibly lucky, millions of people watching your art. So be passionate, 
Driven, and tell us your stories. And another thing that will help you tell your stories is our sponsor, Musicbed. Musicbed is an amazing place to find music for any project made by talented artists and musicians. You can choose from over 40,000 songs and curated roster of over 1,000 authentic and relevant artists, including some that will give you a Williams Spielberg film vibe, like Joseph William Morgan, all available to license for any project. And finding music is easy with their browse and search tools built in with filmmakers and creatives in mind. Use anything from genre and mood to advanced filters like BPM and key. If you still need help finding what you need, their team can help with complimentary song searches. And if you use the coupon code FILMRIOT at checkout, you get one month free when you grab an annual subscription and it helps us make episodes like this. So take your projects and films to the next level with Music Band. 